Hello, everybody. My name is Dave. I work with the Middlesex County Office of Rutgers Cooperative Extension. We're glad you could all join us tonight for Are You Ready to Garden? Should be a fairly popular topic, as I know many of us <laughs> gardeners in New Jersey have to consider the deer herds. So Pat will have some great information for us. And as you may all know, just about every county in New Jersey has a Rutgers Cooperative Extension office, and you are watching programming coming from the Middlesex County office. Middlesex County office of Rutgers Cooperative Extension is located in the Earth Center, 42 Riva Ave. It's in Middlesex County's great Davidson's Mill Pond Park, where our master gardeners and environmental stewards have some great demonstration gardens and displays. So come on out this season. I know everyone's excited to get back in the great outdoors and Davidson's Mill Pond Park and the Earth Center is a great place to do it. Rutgers Cooperative Extension programming is brought to you by the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station out of Rutgers University. So we're very thankful for the, all the resources that they provide the counties throughout our great state. And one of the many programs that come out of Rutgers Cooperative Extension is the Master Gardener Program. And we are tapping the vast knowledge of our Master Gardeners tonight and in the coming weeks to get some great gardening information. Tonight we're fortunate to have Patricia Donahue with us. Pat Donahue is a Middlesex Master Gardener with a BS degree from Columbia and an MS degree from Rutgers, both in the sciences. After a 15-year career in environmental protection, Pat became a science teacher. Recently retired after 23 years in the classroom, Pat earned her Master Gardener Certificate to properly manage the extensive garden of her and her husband's historic home. And Pat has been doing a lot of great programs, uh, presentations with our Master Gardener Speakers Bureau. And we're very thankful to have her here tonight to talk about discouraging deer and an integrated approach. Thanks so much right. for being here. No problem. Thank you for that nice introduction. So I've been giving a variety of talks and no matter what I'm talking about, no matter which group, someone will raise their hand and ask me about deer. So finally, I decided that it was time to just have a presentation about deer. And that's how this came about. The first thing is to try and look at the world through the perspective of a deer. And deer basically care about one thing, and that's not being eaten. They are, um, despite their big size, they are a prey animal. And so they have evolved with uh, very large ears that hear very well, very large eyes with a great field of vision, and um, a very highly sensitive nose. And they use these advantages um, to detect predators. Now we call them white-tailed deer uh, because when they are frightened or they, they think that something is wrong, they will raise their tail and show the white fur that's underneath. This is a danger signal. So the tail will go up, they'll flare the fur, um, and hold it up like a flag to signal danger. And then they run. They can run quite fast. They can jump uh, quite far and high. Uh, their hooves provide them with really good stability uh, to be able to do all of this running and jumping. And typically, uh, the predators that they are looking out for are things like bear, coyote, bobcat, wolves, and alligators. Now, if you look at that list and you think about New Jersey, you'll realize that we don't have any of those anymore. Deer managed to uh, really extend their range. Uh, you can see that they're in almost all parts of the United States and then down into the northern reaches of South America. So they have quite an extensive range that they live in. And in New Jersey, um, the deer were hunted to near extinction by about 1900. But since then, they have recovered to the point where there are now about 120 deer per square mile. 
Now that's a rough number because there are a lot more deer in some places and fewer in others. Now the females usually have twins. I picked this photograph because this lucky girl had triplets. And the males, um, although unusual to weigh up to 400 pounds, they can. Uh, they don't live very long in the wild, only about two to three years. And where do they live? Well, they like mixed woods, fields, and brushy areas like margins. You'll often see deer coming kind of at that edge between the woods and a farmer's field. Um, that's a margin. And suburbs provide a lot of margins. It's one of the reasons that the deer uh, like the suburbs. They can have a large home range from a half to three square miles. And they will um, eat a variety of uh, materials, twigs, shoots, flowers, fruits, nuts. And why most of you are probably here, they'll eat our landscaping. And they eat a lot of it, five to seven pounds per day per deer. And they're really cute. What? They're a big pest. Now, I know that most of you are here because you're gardeners, but I do want to take a couple of minutes and discuss what really makes the deer a problem. And that is their interactions with humans and our cars. Uh, there are up to about 30,000 deer collisions a year causing a billion dollars in vehicle damage and a few people die every year uh, in these deer-related traffic accidents. In New Jersey, the top towns for deer collisions, and that should say four because I added one, Flemington, Hillsborough, Jackson, and Freehold. And these are the same areas where uh, there's increased development and that is encroaching on the traditional deer habitat. So there have been any number of means uh, to try and uh, stop some of these collisions. And many of you have probably heard about those whistles that you put on your car. Uh, none of that stuff really works. But a couple of folks um, at the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, uh, discovered the following. They realized that deer see best along the strong blue and ultraviolet part of the light spectrum. And at dusk, when deer are most active, the ultraviolet light is the one that is most available. And that's the one that they'll see in. So they do not see red and orange. Um, and they don't see headlights moving. They don't see the movement. It doesn't, none of these. Um, signals that our cars are given off um, are providing them with any information. So a couple of folks working at USDA developed a rear-facing light bar in the ultraviolet that shines into the grill of a car. And so now the deer can actually see that something is moving toward them. And they have actually been able to get the uh, collisions down by 90%. Now this is not available on the market. Um, the, they've applied for a patent and it is pending, um, but the missing piece here is that they need an investor to actually uh, implement the patent to produce the device and market it to the public. So if anyone has you know, a lot of money and needs a project, um, here's a good one for you. So the other issue, um, other than traffic, is uh, deer and our New Jersey farmers. We are, after all, the Garden State. And um, there are a lot of financial losses from deer eating uh, crops, but also doing um, additional damage. And it is impacting the farmer's ability to change or rotate their crops uh, to deal with weeds, et cetera. And we're talking about a lot of money. So the 27 farms that were surveyed 
just those um, lost $1.3 million. And then there are a lot of other costs that don't necessarily come up in dollars, uh, environmental damage, uh, impacts to operations, and even the emotional toll of these farmers, this is their livelihood, they work from dawn to dark, and the deer are just munching away. So in areas where there's farming, uh, there can be anywhere from 60 to 239 deer per square mile. Research has shown, however, that the recommended carrying capacity of that habitat should be only 10 deer per square mile. Uh, so this is a really serious problem for farmers. Another problem that um, in studying the farms that was realized is that while there is some deer management on, for farmers, there is none in the suburbs. So the deer will hide out in the suburbs and then come out in the evening and go into the fields and eat the crops. Uh, some farmers want to give up and they're losing 25% of every paycheck. So the state of New Jersey has for a very long time um, manage the deer population, and they've set up deer management zones. There are 69 areas and a, nine sets of regulations. Um, in some areas, certain things are allowed, and in other areas, they are not. And I've since found out that our regulations are one of the most liberal in the country. So they really do provide uh, for a lot of variety and opportunity uh, to control the deer with this program. So hunting is the most efficient and cost-effective control method. Now, I'm one of those people, I don't kill things. Um, there are certain exceptions, mosquitoes, ticks, and horse flies. But to me, deer are really cute, and I really don't like this whole concept of hunting until I was doing the research for this particular presentation. And I have to say, I changed my mind. There's, um, there are some problems with our hunting uh, management program. And here are some of them. Recreational hunting is not enough. It'll take a hunter uh, an entire day of hunting to kill one deer. And our interest in hunting um, has really declined. Myself as an example, it's just not something that I ever uh, had an interest in. So in other areas, other states, they hire sharpshooters and um, what they call management hunting professionals. And it's done only every few years. And depending on the program chosen, it is not that expensive um, to hunt the deer. Another thought that has occurred to people is that since the auto insurance industry has to pay so much money for all of these accidents, that perhaps the insurance company should be asked to fund some of the hunting programs to reduce the deer population. And uh, in New Jersey, it is not legal to um, sell any deer meat. There is no market for deer meat. And in other countries, they have developed ways of being able to hunt the deer and provide the meat as food. Um, we need to look into that some more because that would help uh, a lot of people and people who, who need more protein in their diet. So what we really want to talk about here today, and why I think you're here, is about deer damage. They um, damage your plants. They rub on the tree saplings and kill them. They flatten your vegetation. And you can identify that damage by looking for their tracks, their droppings, and some of the damage that they do. So in late summer and early fall, you get a particular kind of damage when the bucks or the males are rubbing their antlers on trees to establish their territories and communicate with one another. 
They like uh, smaller saplings, and so they can very easily kill them um, when they uh, really rub very hard against them. And the bucks prefer a softer tree, such as a cedar or a pine, so you'll often see that those are more damaged than others. So one of the most um, effective ways of dealing with deer and keeping them away from your property or from your trees is to have a fence. There are two basic types of fencing. There's a barrier fence um, and a netting fence. Now, I do not recommend the fences made with netting um, unless, and I'll show it to you in the next slide, uh, because other creatures can get trapped in and killed in the netting. So for example, you can inadvertently catch uh, bats and birds when what you really wanted was to keep the deer out. You can use a netted fence if um, the netting is very, very taut so that other animals will not get tangled up in it. So fencing can be portable, it can be temporary or permanent. It can range from expensive to very expensive, from low to high maintenance. But in all cases, it should be six, probably to nine feet high, uh, with your posts 10 to 15 feet apart and reinforced. So here are two pictures um, of on the left with the light colored wood is uh, a fencing and on the other one is a netted, more netted fencing. But you'll notice that they're both very taut. Some folks have tried electric fencing. Now this requires a power source, and if your power goes out, then your fence isn't working. And if it's not high enough, the deer will simply jump over it. So the whole idea of having an electric fence doesn't really work. If you have to make it eight or nine feet high, then you might as well just have a regular eight or nine foot high fence. And with an electric fence, uh, you can um, accidentally um, hurt or impact other wildlife that might be in the area. Now, I saw this when I was in my master gardener class, this picture, and um, I said, wow, that's a neat idea. If the deer think that they can't jump a fence, uh, for example, a slanted fence like this one, uh, they won't go. But the problem is, and I didn't notice this at first and, until the instructor mentioned it, how do you mow under this? Because it gets more and more slanted um, close to the ground. So this one I think is a little bit tricky, although it certainly would keep uh, the deer out. Some other easier ideas, and one that works very well at my house, is to have a fence that at least on one side, you let the vegetation grow right up to it. Because if deer can't take off or land on one side, they won't jump over the fence. Now I have a six foot fence and um, have not had a deer in my backyard. So if you're going to do a fence, um, if you have a short fence and I, been asked this question, well, I already have a fence and it's three feet or four feet and the deer go right over it. Well, it's been discovered that if you add a, another fence and it doesn't have to be fancy, you can use those, those green stakes and then tie some cheap netting to it, but you put it parallel to your existing fence, but three feet away the deer won't jump even though both fences are low because they would have to jump in between the two fences and then jump again. And deer will not jump into what they see as a confining space. So this is something you could even do temporarily. It doesn't have to be there all year, um, but it's something that you could consider doing if you want to protect a certain part of your garden for a certain time of the year. All right, so next we're going to talk about deterrence, something that serves to discourage, prevent, or inhibit. 
dogs. Dogs are a very good deterrent. Um, we have a dog who regularly patrols our backyard. And um, if he sees or hears or smells uh, anything, the deer, the fox, well, whatever else is back there, um, he's protecting our property. Uh, some dogs will actually uh, chase the deer. And it doesn't even have to be a big dog. You can have a small dog um, that will actually keep the deer out of your yard. Now, if you don't like dogs or you don't have one, and I'm being a little tongue in cheek here, you could try a cat. There are some cats that will actually uh, chase deer that will protect their property. And um, what you don't want to happen is to have a dog that is afraid of the deer and the deer chase it. But I have a cute little video here and let me see if I can. So this yes. person looked out in their backyard and found that their dog had made friends with the deer and was actually playing with it. So you have to really wonder about their, their is your dog a deterrent or not? Uh, so this is, I believe, is that same dog with his buddy, the deer. And uh, here's another one who actually is uh, hanging out with a fawn. But what you really don't want to happen is to come home and find this. So some dogs will be quite good at this um, and others will not. So if you have a dog, um, hopefully they're, they're the right kind that can keep the deer away. Now, this won't work here, but I just thought this was so clever. You can make alligators from recycled tires and set them up in your lawn, and this will frighten the deer away. Now, that's not going to work in New Jersey. It'll certainly work in the southern parts of the country. Uh, but here, our deer have no experience with alligators, so they would have no reason to be afraid of all these tires that you put out in your garden. I just thought this was clever. All right. So how about a repellent, something that will drive away or ward off the deer? And there are four basic ways um, to, to go about this, by taste, odor, sound, or sight. So I'm going to start with sight and use the deer's own warning system against it. You can try tying white flags that are about the shape and size of the deer's tail when they shoot their tail up as a danger signal. And especially if it's a little breezy, this tail will move and the deer will think that there is a problem and they may get spooked and run away. Another repelling by sight are motion activated lights um, with a timer. So the deer activate the light and then a few, it stays on a few minutes and it goes off again. The better type are solar powered, so you don't have to have electrical cords out there. And you can even mount them on stands and then move your pole or your stand that you haven't mounted on every day, um, every few days. One of the tricks to any of the approaches that I'm talking about today is going to be that you have to move it. You have to move it or replace it or the deer get used to it and ignore it and it loses its effectiveness. As an example, a neighbor of mine bought these red blinking lights and put them on his house and on his mailbox and the deer within a couple of weeks could have cared less about these red blinking lights. And everybody on the block now looks outside and sees all of these red blinking lights from his property and they're not doing any good anymore. Um, I don't know why he doesn't take them down. So you can also repel by sound. Now there are um, deer have very sensitive ears. They don't like loud or strange sounds. They'll get frightened. There was some talk for a while that, oh, you know, you don't want these loud sounds because they're going to bother you, right, the homeowner? How about ultrasonic devices? Well, they don't work for deer because deer don't hear uh, in those other um, frequencies. So some simple things, excuse me, <coughs> pie pans, the little aluminum ones, you can hang a couple of them 
uh, close together. So the breeze blows and they, they clack into each other, um, a radio. And if you want to spend a little bit more money and get a little bit fancier, this is what some of the farmers do, is they use sound cannons. Another um, more effective way is a solar motion activated um, lawn sprinkler. So one, if something walks by this sprinkler head, it is activated and it shoots out jets of water. You can connect it to a standard uh, garden hose and you can customize it for your area just as if it was a regular sprinkler head. Um, but keep in mind that if you activate it or your dog activates it, you're going to get shot with a blast of water too. <clears throat> and then there's a whole class that I'll just call the chemical repellents. And um, this is when things get, get tricky. Uh, first of all, you have to start using them before the deer have discovered your property. And you have to really think about how large an area are you trying to protect and how reasonable is it to expect that entire area to be sprayed. Now, these sprays will not um, completely eliminate the problem, they'll reduce it. And the sprays are mostly for ornamental plants uh, they're not to be used on food crops. Um, if you spray it on a, something that you plan to eat, uh, then you really can't eat that anymore. Um, you have to change formulations depending on the time of year. And for many of these, you have to hire someone who's got the proper licensing and permitting to be allowed to use them. So as, as a homeowner, I don't know that I recommend this. So these repellents have um, a varied effectiveness. Uh, they'll be impacted by how fast your plants are growing, how much precipitation there's been, and um, how dense are, is the deer population. They can also be a pretty expensive. Um, and it's not just a you sprayed it and you're done. You have to reapply. In fact, um, each leaf has to be sprayed. So as your plant grows and it gets new leaves, all those new leaves also um, have to be sprayed. Once your plant is completely grown, uh, then the spray might last you three months. And there are four um, that are popular on the market. One is called Liquid Fence. Uh, it's rain resistant, but it smells awful. So if you're spraying your garden and it's close to your house or under your windows, this may not be the one for you. Uh, another one that became popular is a peppermint-based spray. And of course, you would think, oh, this is all natural. It smells nice. It's peppermint. Um, the only problem is it doesn't work at all against the deer. Then there's uh, Bob X, which smells really bad. Um, but appears to work well. And a last one called plant skid uh, that will work for a variety of animals, um, but it will attract others, particularly dogs. And uh, depending on where you're putting it, it will actually stain your plants red. Uh, so unless your plants are already red, and you can imagine that everything you have out there is then going to be red. So there are some simpler um, methods. And uh, one is to use a um, bar of very heavily scented uh, deodorant soap. You can either hang the bars themselves with twine, um, hang them about 30 inches um, off the ground, um, put them in shrubs, hang them from uh, tree branches, and uh, no more than every 20 feet. You can also take, uh, so that you don't have to buy quite as much, 
you can use a cheese grater and you can grate the soap and then put the uh, grated soap into small uh, like potpourri bags and um, hang the bags in the same manner. Other things that you can use to put into uh, those little bags are human hair, blood meal, and mothballs. And they'll work, you know, better or worse than others. Um, no matter what you do, uh, if it has been a very long, very cold winter, uh, the deer will be very hungry and, um, and they'll eat. If you take nothing else away with you today, I need you to remember this. You have to alternate the types of repellents that you use. So if you have your um, pie tins out there um, for a week or two, you need to take those inside and hang your bars of soap. And then two weeks after that, you need to set up the uh, lights that come on when they sense movement. And then you, know, you have to switch back and you have to keep moving where you put things and which type of uh, repellent or deterrent you're using. Because the deer are, are kind of smart and they'll quickly realize that whatever it is, they can ignore it. So you have to keep switching it up. And the number one question, um, and the people have been led to believe that there is such a thing as a deer proof or a deer resistant plant. And they just do not exist. If they're hungry enough, the deer will eat anything. And as the population of deer increases, the resistance of your plants decreases because the deer decide it may taste bad or smell bad or whatever it is, but we're eating it anyway. Now, there are some deer-resistant plants. Uh, they have some common characteristics. They tend to have a rough texture. Um, they may be naturally poisonous. So when you're looking for what to plant, um, what grows in your area? What are your native plants? Because many of the native plants have evolved to cope with deer eating them. Um, You'll have some variable success uh, with some of these plants, and this is just a general guide. So, for example, in the front of my house, I have daffodils. The deer don't eat them. My neighbor, the one, he of the blinking lights, um, he planted tulips, and he calls me every, every spring or summer and complains that the deer are eating his tulips. And I've just gotten to the point where it's like, well, plant daffodils instead. I don't know what else he wants me to tell him. But Rutgers came up with this really neat interactive site. And I'm going to pull this up. Let's hope this works. They put plants into four categories, from ranging from A, rarely damaged, to D, those that are frequently or severely damaged. And... Um, but you have to recognize that no plant is really, really deer proof. So these will offer you some protection and I wanna show you how it works. Just give me a minute to move it over to the other screen. So I'll pull it up over here and you can search for your plant, or you can go by category. So let's say I want something that is rarely damaged and I want a ground cover, and I want to sort it by which ones are going to be the best. So now I click, and I get a list of ground covers sorted in order by which are the least likely to be damaged to a little bit more likely, but all of them inside that rarely damaged category. So with this list, then you can go off to the uh, garden center and purchase something that may uh, work better in your particular area. 
And um, I don't know, if, Dave, you can do it. I should probably put that link. Maybe I'll put that link in the chat later so that folks can copy it down uh, if they want to use it again. So one of the newer approaches is to actually start thinking about designing with the deer in mind. And there are, I believe, seven or eight um, design categories uh, that you can look at. So number one is hardscape, because deer can't eat hardscape. Um, now, of course, this isn't really gardening, um, but you can use hardscape to keep deer away from certain areas. And uh, this adds value to your property. A second approach is to identify focal points. So something that's not edible, like a, a fountain or a statue or a pot, um, something pretty sculptural, and uh, perhaps in certain um, lines, sight lines, and for example, in this first picture, there's this beautiful pot with the water coming out of it. And what you probably didn't notice is that the plant that was put around it has been browsed by the deer here. Can you see that here in the front? But it's still nice in the back. But unless I pointed that out, chances are you weren't going to notice it. And that's the idea of establishing focal points, something that attracts uh, you to look at it and thereby detracts you from looking, distracts you from looking at uh, what the damage has been. Another idea is to uh, choose a more monochrome uh, color palette or maybe use all pastels, for example. Um, you can mix texture and height uh, to add interest, uh, but what happens is if the deer browse some, because there's a lot of the same color, the damage is not as noticeable. You can layer plants at different heights um, behind and front of each other. You can also use some of these arrangements to put your more deer resistant plants on the outer edge so that the deer don't necessarily notice or get into uh, the ones that they'd be more interested in, which might be hidden kind of behind the others. Rather than feed them all your flowers, uh, look at how you can use foliage instead to create um, color and texture. Uh, you can get, they're longer lasting than flowers. Um, they can have uh, more interest and will discourage deer more so than fields of yummy flowers. If you're going to try and stick with just deer resistant uh, plants themselves, uh, the absolute minimum number that you can combine would be three. Um, if the deer come and there's one that they're more likely to eat, at least there's something else in that area or in the pot uh, that continues to look pretty and attract your interest. Now, the next piece of advice is good for uh, any type of gardening, and that is to avoid a monoculture. Uh, use layers, mix your species, especially for hedges and screens. Um, if you have all of one thing, it's not just not necessarily pretty or good for the environment, uh, but if that's the one thing the deer want to eat, then that's gone. Um, whereas um, in the photograph here on the right, uh, there's more variety. Okay. And um, the last idea uh, are how to employ barriers. And that doesn't necessarily imply a fence. There are many things that deer don't like to walk over. Uh, so some of you may be familiar with what they call the cattle guards or cattle gates, um, which are in the ground and it's at the slatted um, metal 
and the cows won't walk over it. Well, deer won't walk over it either. They also don't like to have to climb around. They don't like to climb around boulders. Uh, they don't like steps. Uh, so you can use some of these elements, um, identify what the deer won't walk over or around, and you can reroute the deer. Um, there's been success with using um, hedgy or thorny uh, bushes so that the deer don't want to come uh, in that way. And you force the deer to have to walk to the end of that hedge of thorny things and exit. In the meantime, you've put all your nice plants on the opposite side, uh, but the deer never actually get to, um, to see them. So many of these ideas uh, I got during a lecture. I actually went to several workshops to prepare for my, my own presentation. And I found uh, Karen Chapman um, with her ideas about deer resistant design. Uh, this is where I got those ideas. So I uh, will give credit where credit is due. So before you, you have some ideas now and you wanna get out there and get started and you've decided which plants you want and how you wanna do this, you're still missing one important piece of information. And that is where are the deer? So I'm going to give you an example. My house is over here and my neighbor's house, he of the blinking red lights, is over here. Now, for the longest time, the deer were always on his side. And I think that there are two main reasons for this. First of all, he had some animals he kept outside. He had bunnies. Uh, he had some chickens, he had peacocks, and I think that the deer felt more comfortable uh, knowing that there were other wildlife um, on that side. On my side, on the other hand, uh, we had two dogs, so the deer didn't come nearby. Unfortunately, uh, one dog passed away and the other one got quite old and she wasn't able, able to patrol, and we started having some deer problems, I think if I click here. So I set up um, a motion activated wildlife camera and I tied it to the fence. And lo and behold, I got images of the deer now actually crossing the property um, on my side rather than on my neighbor's side. And this is how I realized um, that I was starting to lose some of the landscaping in the front of the house that the deer had completely avoided um, before. Uh, we have since gotten a new puppy, and he's out there doing his job uh, and scaring the deer away. And I also have a list here of uh, some good resources of the, from the Humane Society, a couple there from uh, PETA. And um, also a fact sheet from Rutgers um, about the white-tailed deer. In closing, you see this here, this website, that's where you can get some of those fact sheets. Thank you to uh, Rutgers and Cooperative Extension. And here is the email for the Master Gardeners Helpline. Uh, you can contact us uh, if you have any questions about any type of gardening, even if you need some reminders about what we've talked about today about deer. So we are here when you need us. If you're in the Middlesex County slash Central Jersey area, we've got a great um, story map available showing you all our local growers and direct marketers as the season progresses. You can check them out by following this QR code and checking out their product, tinyurl.com midco grows. And of course, if for folks out of central Jersey, call up your extension office so we can get you in touch with the local extension office that would serve you best, your local master gardeners. If you're in North, North Jersey or South, South Jersey, you're not going to get the best information from us in Middlesex County or Monmouth County. You got to talk to the locals for the best info.
I would like to uh, thank Pat Donahue for her fantastic uh, presentation tonight. As we You're wrap welcome. things up, we, we thank you for uh, your participation. All right. Thank you all for listening. Pat, thank um, you so much. Great job. <laughs> no problem. Bye-bye. Thanks.